So we're ready to start part, part two of optimal power flow. We have seen the theory and the necessary optimization background last week and how this can be used in simple cases. Now what we will study today is uncertainty and how it can be handled, which is one of the very important technical points. So I recall here a very simple Si uh, simple o OPF for this toy example, three nodes, it's a circular grid and with the DC approximation we obtain those simple equations where the state variables that represent the grids are the angles theta 2, theta 3, the derived variables are the branch power flows and the control variables are the power injections of the generators and uh, potentially also of the loads. This is how we can formulate the OPF. But in reality, when we do such an OPF, we don't know for sure uh, what the load values will be exactly. We do a forecast, and if we do a good forecast, we obtain a value that are perhaps the values I showed here. But perhaps if we do a good forecast, we should not get, obtain a point forecast, a single value, but a prediction interval. If I do this, that reflects the uncertainty I have on the forecast, I may know, for example, those bounds here. Those are the bounds that I can uh, more reasonably give about the loads here. Some terminology in control theory and optimization theory, this is called a disturbance. So any fixed a parameter that would be fixed in the optimization problem, like the loads, but that is in fact unknown, is called a disturbance. It's variable, but it's not a variable on which we can play. It's something that's imposed to us by nature, if we want. Right. Here I've put in blue the disturbances and in red the control variables. So the simple version of this uh, OPF would be to say, given the blue values, I need to decide on red values and how should I do this? Before... Um, before getting into the details, let's first ask the questions correctly. So this is an example of what is called either robust or stochastic optimization. This immediately asks two problems. The formulation we gave consisted in minimizing the total costs of generation. But if we follow the flow power balance equations, for any value of the disturbance, there will be a different value of the generation. So what should we do with the costs? If we don't know the disturbance, we don't know either what the optimal generation will be, and therefore the cost itself becomes influenced by the disturbance. So the question is, what should we minimize? So that's perhaps the most open question. Now another thing that must be taken into account is when we set up constraints, for example, the maximum power on the branches, which are very important for the security of the grid. Since we don't know exactly what the loads will be, we don't know what the power flows will be, so those themselves become also uncertain things. And we must make sure that whatever decision we take, because we will take one decision in advance, that's what we do in every day's life. So the same hap occurs in a grid when we run this grid and one hour before operation we need to agree on the set points, then we will implement those set points. But we have to make sure that whatever the disturbance, the grid constraints will be satisfied here. The grid constraints here. There's also another constraint, indirect constraint, which is the slack bus power, because the slack bus will balance the total power demand on the grid. So if the slack bus capacity is exhausted, my dispatch plan will fail. I will not, be, I will not satisfy all the constraints. So that's the, the questions here. There are multiple ways to formulate such a problem, to model such a problem and solve it uh, with MATLAB or other tools. In general, here is the, the setting. We can see that we have what is called a stochastic uh, control problem, where I have a disturbance, as I said, a system state, which is in our case the state of the grid, the theta, perhaps also all the derived variables, 
And what we assume here is that the mapping that allows us to translate the set of the control actions and the disturbance to the state is well known. So capital F is not random. We have, those are for us, the equations of the power grid. Then for any value of my control, any value of the disturbance, there is a resulting state. So it's like a game where nature plays a disturbance. I have to play a control and the result is X. So I don't control entirely the X, but I can influence it by choosing U. The cost, therefore, itself depends on the disturbance, because the cost is typically a cost of the control. The control is, for example, the generator set point. If it's a fuel-based generator, how much I generate will directly influence the cost. But it depends also typically on the state, for example, because the state drives also the slack bus power, or also because there are soft uh, constraints that are included in penalties for the line uh, currents, for example. So this cost depends on the disturbance here. In stochastic optimization, a very frequent thing to do is to solve the issue of, since this is random, what should I minimize? Then I minimize simply the average or the expected value. So if I know something about D, which we hope we do, it's random but it's not completely arbitrary, I can know its distribution, if I know the function of the cost, and if I know how the state is depending on my control action, this should be red, and, uh, and, uh, and the disturbance, then I can at least in theory compute the expected cost. So that gives us one way to formulate the problem. The stochastic optimization formulation consists in saying, minimize the expected cost that results from my control action, when the expectation is understood as expected, uh, averaged over all the possible realizations of the disturbance. But there is another constraint I have to add. The constraint is for whatever disturbance, the state must be acceptable. So we have two parts. First, we have to compute an expected cost. Second, and this is what will give us more work, to do is we have to address the need to express this for all. Whatever something we don't know, the constraint must be satisfied. So this is what we will see in detail how to handle in the coming uh, hours now. So that is the first formulation for what is called a stochastic optimization problem. Let's do it uh, with this uh, example here. So our disturbances are the loads, which are now uh, varying in some interval here. Right. To solve such a problem, in the framework that I give, I need to express the state as a function of my control actions, which requires here a bit of work. When we just solved the optimization problem in the past week, we put together all the variables, all the constraints, in the variables, there are variables that are truly my control actions, like G2, G3, and there are other variables like the state and the indirect variables like the power flows on the lines. So I did not explicitly compute how the electrical state varies as a result of my control action, because we, the framework of constraint optimization allows us to let, to leave the constraints implicit. Here in this framework, we need to work a bit more. We need to make the constraint explicit. This is what I'm making here. So I'm putting this problem in this standard form. So the problem is to write this function here. I need to find what is the expected cost, which is the cost that depends only on the state and the, on the control action and the disturbance here. So the first thing to, to do this is to compute the expected cost. Here it's fairly easy. The expected cost is the cost of, so the cost, if I remove the expectation, is the cost of G2, G3, and which are my control action. But the cost, sorry, I should uh, come back here. So the cost is given at the top, is the cost of the 
uh, of G1 plus G2 plus G3. I think it should not be a G1 bar here. If I don't do stochastic optimization, I will have simply the cost of G1. But now, G1 by the power flow equation is simply equal to minus G2 minus G3 plus the sum of the loads. G1 is the slack bus, it does the power balance. So the expected value of C of the cost component that's related to G1 here is very simple because everything is linear. By assuming this simple example, the cost is linear. We'll come back a bit later to examples where this might not be linear. If it's linear, the expectation of C1, G1 is C1 multiplied by the expectation of G1. And the expectation of G1, which is written on the top, is simply the expectation of L1, L2, L3 minus G1 minus G3. The only thing that's really difficult in this framework is to understand what we are doing here. So here again, I repeat, what we are doing is, it's a game with two actors, we, the controllers, and nature that plays the disturbance. Nature plays something that is, we treat as random. What we do is not random for our viewpoint, even though some people do random things, but we, in principle, choose a control action, so we treat it as non-random. So in this expectation here, when I say the, when I do the expectation of G1, G2 and G3 are not random. They are my control actions. So they are fixed once I decide them. What I don't know is L1, L2, L3, and I replace them by their average values, which I here assume I know. How do I know the expected values? Well, I must assume a distribution. For example, if I give you this interval, I could assume some distribution. If I, somebody tells you L1 is between 90 and 110, what distribution assumption could you make on this? What would you assume? Any suggestion? Gaussian or flat, yeah, so in fact we don't know because having only the bounds doesn't give us the distribution, but if we could reasonably model it either as Gaussian by saying perhaps this is a 99% confidence interval for a Gaussian random variable from which I can conclude the mean, which would be 100, and the standard deviation, which will be given by uh, such that 2 dots 30 something times the width of the interval is equal to the standard deviation. That would be one way to do it. Or I can assume it's uniform. That's another uh, possibility. If I don't know anything about something other than it is inside an interval, then the least informa informative distribution I can take is the uniform distribution. It's the one that maximizes entropy given those constraints. So either way, we find that the expected value will be 100. It's here, since the cost is linear, all we need about the distribution is the expected value, in fact, to do this uh, part of the cost here. So that takes care of the first problem, which was to replace the cost, which is uncertain because once I have chosen my control actions, nature will play a disturbance and then the cost will be influenced by that. But now I say I don't know what the disturbance will be, so I am trying to minimize the expected value. We will see in a few more minutes that, that the, there are other approaches. This is the optimistic approach where we try to minimize the expected value. So with a bit of math, we see that we G1 bar depends on my control action G2, G3 on the expected values of the load. So that gives me this. So the cost is a function of my control action G2, G3. So that's fairly simple. Replacing the expectation is fairly simple. The other part is a bit more tricky because now the constraints we here is for example the list of the constraints which are about power generation and branch powers, branch power flows. So the constraints have my control actions, so that's fairly easy. G2, G3 should be between bounds, but since I play them, it's no, no big deal to find them. But the things in green are resulting from my control action and the disturbance. They are state, in fact. Uh, of this grid here. So to apply this framework, I need to make explicit the function f that gives the state as a function of disturbance and control action. 
this is what I'm doing here. I need to find g1, theta2, theta3 as a function of all the other things, my control actions and the disturbance. Now, since everything is linear, it's not very difficult to do it. So this is what we obtain here, g1, that's the first equation we saw. And then by eliminating uh, the unnecessary variables in the previous equation, that's what we obtain. So that's the step we need to do here, this stochastic optimization. I know that if I play G2 and G3, and if nature plays L1, L2, L3, those are the values that I will obtain for the, uh, for the angles and for the uh, slack bus power here. Now the constraints are explained here. What I've done is I've replaced in the constraints their expression as a function of the control and disturbances. And therefore, I obtain now what we can call a standard uh, optimization problem with a quantifier here. The constraints are here, are given here. So remember here, G2, G3 is what I have to decide. L1, L2, L3 are unknown things, but that are assumed to be in those intervals here. Given in this form, there is, it's no longer a stochastic problem, even though it was the formulation that resulted from a stochastic expression of the problem. But now there is no distribution, there is no concept of probability. It is a problem of this kind. I have to minimize some function of a control variable u subject to linear inequalities, so that's the good news, they are linear, so we will be able to uh, efficiently handle them. But there is a quantifier, so these linear inequalities involve the control variable and a disturbance, and they have to be true for any value of the disturbance that satisfies itself a constraint. The constraints are the bounds that are given at the top. Here. This is called a robust optimization problem. An optimization problem is an optimization problem where there would be no quantifier here. A robust optimization problem means an optimization problem where the control variable is u. So here we're minimizing over u. We don't choose d. Someone else will choose d for us. But the u that we choose must be such that for any choice of d over which we think there are some constraints, that our choice of u will result in this inequality being true. So that's the thing uh, we have to do. First, let's, in order to know how to handle it, we must check that we correctly understand it. We will do transformation of the robust inequalities. So here is a question about transformation. Here I'm giving you a robust constraint, u1 plus 2u2 plus 3d1 is less than or equal to 10, subject to, uh, su for any value of d1, which itself satisfies inequalities of being between 0 and 5. And I'm proposing two formulations. Is any of those two true, according to you? And the majority says that both are correct, which is true. So this is really the essential thing to see, because this is how we will handle that. So the essential step is to realize this. Thing. Saying that an expression is less than all values of f of d1 for all values of d1 is the same, at least if d is finite, this is certainly true, is the same as saying that this expression is less than or equal to the minimum. Right. So it's very simple to think about it, but that's essential. That's the trick we will use. Saying that a number a is less than x and y is the same as saying that a is less than the minimum of the two. If you're less than two things, you're less than the minimum. And conversely, if it's larger than two things, it would mean uh, larger than the maximum here. So why is it important? Well, because since now we know how to do optimization, 
I can replace a constraint like this by a constraint that says expression less than the minimum overall d1 that satisfies the constraint on d1 of f of d1. Why is it important? Because, well, this expression here is not a function of d1. Although d1 appears here, but d1 is a dummy letter, it's a dummy variable in this expression. When I say minimize f of x over x, the result of this does not depend on x. Right? It's like when I integrate integral of sine x dx, the result doesn't depend on x. The result depends on the bounds of the integral. So x here is a dummy variable. In this expression that we have here, when we say expressionless for all d1, the condition also is not a condition on d1. That's what I'm writing here. When I say the constraint here is not a constraint on d1, it's a constraint on u1, u2. For every value of u1 and u2, I can say whether this is true or not. And it depends only on u1 and u2. To know whether it is true, I, we might require some work to do. But if we are an oracle that knows everything, the answer to that depends only on u1, u2. So as soon as you have a quantifier in front of a variable, in fact, it means this variable is a dummy variable. The outcome of the complete story does not depend on this variable. So this is what we're doing here. When we have expression less than minimum of f of d1, then we replace the thing that by the result of an optimization problem. So in our case here, what is it? The f of d1 is 10 minus 3 d1, and the constraints are between 0 and 5. So the result, the right-hand side, is this. Minimum overall d1 of 10 minus 3 d1, which was answer A of the quiz here. Right. So this is exactly equivalent to the problem here. Now what is B? Well, B is simply computing this. Remember, an expression like this does not depend on d1. I could call this variable z or gamma or whatever name you want. I could call it var if you want. Minimum over z of 10 minus 3z is the same, right? And in all cases, the value is minus 5. So this is equivalent here. So this is how we did here. On the top, I had a constraint that depend on a disturbance. And I replace it by a constraint that does not depend on the, dis on the disturbance. I've made this constraint, which is written in an implicit form, in order to really know what it means, I need to do some work. Here, I've made it explicit. Here. This is what we will need to do for our optimization problem. So whenever we have, I do it once for all. Here, I'm writing the general form of an optimization problem where the constraints are linear with respect to the control variable and the disturbance, and it's more than linear. This is not the general description of a linear thing. It's, sorry, it's linear uh, between, uh, with respect to both U and D globally. Right. So that's the easy case. How can I solve this? Well, so when I write this here, it means each of those constraints is one inequality. So there's capital J inequality, right? And, Aj is a vector, which has same dimension as u, my control variable. Bj is a vector that has same dimension as d, my disturbance. The dimension of u and d need not be the same here. So what we have seen in the quiz, we can do in general. It's not any different from what we say. So I have this to explain. Then I, what I will say, I put this on the other side of the inequality. So that means a u is less than gamma minus b d. And it has to be true for any value of d. Therefore, I solve an optimization problem, find the minimum for all values of d of the right-hand side subject to the constraint that are imposed to d. For each constraint, I have one optimization problem. So if I have 200 constraints, I will have 200 optimization problems to serve. And that's what we expect. As soon as we do robust or stochastic optimization problem, expect the complexity of your optimization problem to explode. It will be much more complex. But we will see techniques, at least in some simple cases, to make it tractable. Here I have a large number of optimization problems. 
but each optimization problem is a simple one. So I can solve it. The complexity grows linearly with j here. So for each of those, I will find an optimal value hj. And therefore, the j constraint is equivalent to the left-hand side that I have less than j here. Therefore, I have now an optimization problem. Here, the bar is missing. Minimum of c of u subject to this constraint which is exactly what we did in the quiz, except now we will need to do it uh, for each of the constraints. So let me do it for one constraint. The first constraint, if I look at all the constraints I had in this example, which is the slack bus power flow, is that it's uh, non-negative, because the slack bus can only generate here uh, in this assumption. It's a generator, not a battery then uh, it means that this has to be non-negative and it has to be true for all L1, L2, L3. So I do what I did in the example here. First, I separate the control and the disturbance and I solve, find the minimum of the right-hand side over all values of L1, L2, L3. And here it's a simple thing because it's a monotonic function of L1, L2, L2. The constraints are separable. In general, we have a linear problem, linear program to solve, but here the minimum of the sum is simply obtained when each of the values minimum, which gives this value here. So G2 plus G3 has to be less than or equal to 660, which is the case where all the loads will be minimum here. Right. So that is one of the constraints. If I do it for all the constraints, so this is what we did here. This was the first constraint. It was showing on the other side, but we, when we print it prettily, it shows now on the right-hand side. This was the first constraint we did. So I did it for each of the constraints. Each sign here was one constraint. I did it everywhere. So those are the initial constraints. All of those are the de-robustified constraint here. So after doing that, with some work, as you can see, it's not completely trivial. I have now a standard linear program. Then I can solve it. And I can see uh, uh, what happens. But before looking at what happens, imagine I change the uncertainty bounds. I assume the loads are not plus or minus 10%, roughly speaking, but plus or minus 50%. So I changed the... Uh, uncertainty bound for L1 and L2, and I do the same work again. Here are the set of constraints I obtain. And then what do we observe? Then they are inconsistent. Here G2 plus G3 should be less than 497, but at the same time it should be larger than 503, which means the set of constraints gives us an infeasible problem. So we have an example now of an optimization problem that is non-feasible. That may happen and will frequently happen if we have very large uncertainty about the disturbances. Essentially, we're saying here, if the, with this simplistic grid and this simplistic control method, if the uncertainty is very large, it's not possible to decide in advance of one combination of power set points for generators 2 and 3, that will work regardless of this large variability. So that's the first take-home message. We spoke last week of linear programs that may be infeasible. Well, this is a natural uh, source of generation of infeasible linear programs here. So I solved it numerically, and I'm plotting here uh, the, the value of uh, the uncertainty on L3, so I assume I scaled the uncertainty uh, from the values that are in the example I gave 10, 10, 20, and I increased them linearly. So at the first example we show, it were 20 here. If it's zero, that means we have the non-robust problem that we saw last week. And we saw that if we go beyond some value, there is no solution, the problem becomes infeasible. In fact, by exploring it, I found the boundary of infeasibility is here. When we reach 100 for the uncertainty of L3, it still works. But beyond that, the problem becomes unfeasible. So that's the first take-home message. When we robustify a problem, uh, if the uncertainty is too large, the problem may become unfeasible. 
But the second thing we can observe here is I'm plotting here the expected, the optimal expected cost. So the C bar of G. If my forecast is good in average, and if I do that every hour during an entire year, then what I will really pay will be a close approximation to the expected cost. And that's if, if things are okay. By the law of large numbers, if you do many, many times an experiment and you take the average, then the average of what you obtain is close to the expectation. So the integral over the year will be uh, proportional to the, it will be the average multiplied by the number of times I've done it here. So that truly reflects the running cost of something that we do repeatedly. We see that if we make it robust, if we have some uncertainty about the loads and we need to decide in advance, the cost increases with uncertainty. Right. In fact, if it increases uh, in a non negligible way, if the uncertainty is here, it's quasi double the initial value of the cost here. Right. That's also, it's a completely obvious thing, but it's something that's very frequently forgotten. Any uncertainty we have on a, system, on a complex system on which we have to take decisions in advance induces a higher cost. Right. Very often it's forgotten. You, you read statements that say, well, the the, the, the consumption of energy last year was so much and so much, therefore we could have done this and that. We could have used only wind generators and not invest in a, in a gas, power plant, gas uh, power, uh, power plant, for example. Such statements, they, they ignore the uncertainty that existed when the decision was taken. If I know exactly what the future will be, I can do the optimal and I will pay this. But if I don't know and I have to take a decision, for example, an investment decision that truly must be taken in advance, or a market decision for generators that has to be taken in the best case one hour or 15 minutes before operation, in worst case one day before, or if you do long-term uh, contracts even uh, before. If I have some uncertainty and I don't know about it, I will need to pay more. So, of course, people can come later and say, but the value was 100. Why did you choose uh, such a generator set point? The generator set points are given here. We see that depending on the uncertainty, this is the G2 and G3. We see that depending on the uncertainty, we give different values to G2 and G3 here because of the grid constraints. We, uh, we cannot operate in the same region. So that's very important to remember. Any uncertainty on the disturbance when you have to take a control action before will typically, to, will typically lead to an increased cost. That's why it's important to give forecasts and to obtain forecasts that have prediction intervals, not just a point forecast. If somebody tells you the next, the future is this, eh, where should you operate? You will pick something somewhere. If you just do this and there is a small disturbance, you might violate one of the constraints uh, of the grid here. So you will have other, you will have runtime problems. Okay, so this was uh, the, the first very simple, uh, technically simple uh, example, but it shows all the, all the complexities and all the main elements. What we will do now is dive into variants of this and how we can handle them technically. A variance is, for example, when the cost is not simply linear. A frequent case is if a cost of something is quadratic. In reality, cost is very often a combination of linear and quadratic, but to simplify this example, I assume here a pure case where it's completely quadratic here. Right? So I still assume that the unknown laws are independent. Now I make explicit uh, distribution assumption. I assume they are Gaussian with a mean Li bar that is known and a known variance here. Then we need to transform the problem according to the program we saw before, the general program of stochastic optimization that says you need to handle two things, the cost and the constraints. So the cost is here, 
one of the options is to take it as the expectation. So the expectation now is the expectation of all that stuff. So G2, G3 are my control variables, no problem. This is the derived variable that follows if we play G2, G3 and nature plays L1, L2, L3. And when we take expectation, we treat those as the random variables, L1, L2, L3 here. So if the cost is quadratic, this is gamma times the expectation of this square, right? So I assume the same gamma for all the generators here. So the question becomes how, how, how to solve this? Well, remember here now, I mean, the important thing when we have complicated things is to isolate elements of our problem into sub-problem. And once we have well-defined the sub-problem, we can and should forget about the other details of the problem. Right? So sometimes we refuse to do that. We keep the entire complexity of our problem in our head and then we can't solve or reason properly about it. Here I have a sub-problem. To solve the sub-problem is compute the expectation of this where L1, L2, L3 are random variables that have this distribution here and are independent. So forget about power grids and optimization. Now it's a probability 101 problem. Somebody gives you three random variables. In probability, we would call them x1, x2, x3, right? x1, x2, x3 that are Gaussian independent. Compute the expectation of this. Well, here's the solution. Well, if I call x this big random variable, x is a random variable that has... Now, what I need is to compute the expectation of x square. So expectation of x square is the mean of x to the square plus the variance of x. In fact, that's the definition of the variance of a random variable. So all I need to do is compute the mean of this random variable and its variance. The mean is the sum of the mean, the mean is linear. So the mean is, those are constants from the viewpoint of my little probability exercise. G2, G3 are constants. The mean of L1, L2, L3 are the expected values that uh, we knew from before. What is the variance now? What is the variance of a sum of five things like this? Two of those five things are constants from the viewpoint of probability. If I add a constant to a random variable, is just shifting the random variable. It doesn't change the variance. So we can ignore them in computing the variance. And if three random variables are independent, the variance of the sum is the sum of the variance. Right. If you're unsure, you look up variance in Wikipedia and you'll find it. So the variance of x is the sum of those three things, which is the sum of the three variances here. So we find that the cost here will be equal to gamma times my control set points mean, this plus V1 plus V2 plus G2 plus G3 squared. So we find that we have an objective function, which is a sum of squares of uh, three things here. In general, it is unlikely that all loads are uncorrelated. So this example I'm giving is oversimplified. In reality, it's unlikely that the independent assumption would hold. Can you imagine why? If it's winter, everybody is is heating. Yes, but we know that in winter people will do that. So that should be reflected by L1 bar, L2 bar, L3 bar. Right? What does independence mean? So the disturbance is the truly unknown part of the load. Thing we know about the load is it should be 100 megawatt because we looked at the statistics of the past year for January, for example, if it's winter, and we know people will be heating. But what is unknown is the deviation from that. And independence means that if I observe L1, 
and the only interesting thing about L1 will be how much it deviates from its mean. That's the only information I want now about L1, because I know already the mean of L1 is 100. I know it will be close to 100, but by how much differs? This is the information I will obtain if I observe L1. Then if I observe, the question of independence means if I observe L1, does it give me any information about L2? Any new information, any information I did not have before. The information I had already about L2 is that L2 also has a mean of 100. So this I knew already. But independence means if by accident L1 is higher, is 105 and not 100, does it give me some idea of some, does it help me guess what L2 will do? Will also L2 be higher? In which case that means there's positive correlation between the two. Or will it be lower? Then if the load is due largely to heating and thermal loads, probably, what you, because of the phenomenon you said, it will probably be true. If the winter is colder, or if there is a colder day than expected, then if L1 is higher, probably L2 and also L3 will be higher. So this would uh, probably uh, not be true here because of this. If that's true, then we want to do what is called, for example, scenario-based optimization, or any method that allows us to capture also the correlation between the random variables. We'll come back to scenario-based optimization uh, next week. So right now, this is uh, oops, what we would stay, what we would do here. So we have a quadratic cost. Now, the other part which is more difficult to do once we have um, distributional assumption is the constraints. Remember, the constraints are saying that uh, we have bounds on the power, flow power flows here. If we strictly adhere to the same method we saw 10 minutes ago, where we say we want for any value of the disturbance, we want that the constraints are satisfied. Here, our problem is infeasible, if we strictly do that. Why is it? Well, because in our intellectual world, where we replace L1 by a distribution, a Gaussian random variable, a Gaussian random variable is unbounded from below and above. So, at least theoretically, when we say L1 is Gaussian, that means that a value of minus 100 or plus 1 million can occur. Of course, the probability that you're above uh, a value that is larger than the mean plus 6 sigma, for example, is astronomically small. But it can occur with non-zero probability. So if we want to do things that are deterministic and certain, it's impossible. The load can have any value between minus infinity and plus infinity, so this grid cannot work with any value from one, minus infinity to plus infinity. So we need to, put, to do things where we take a risk, this is called chance constraint. We say, well, with a large probability, for example, with a probability of that size here, we know that the loads will be between bounds here. If something is Gaussian, uh, it will not be much larger than the mean plus a small number of times sigma here. So if I take eta equal 4, that corresponds to, to those values here. So with this simple reasoning here, now we have to account for the fact that this must be true simultaneously for the three. So this is why we have the, the cube here then with some probability, which is very large, we can say that we will be between those bounds here. And we must do that, or something like that, because if we strictly insist on having the constraint true for any value of the disturbance, it's not possible here. The problem will be unfeasible. And this would be vastly uh, pessimistic, because when we say the thing is Gaussian, we don't mean it strictly. Certainly, we don't expect the load to be minus one million, for example. So once we have done that, then that's the good news. The bounds have been transformed into bounds like before. Before I had something taken out of my prediction interval, I'd say it was plus or minus 10. Here I will have something that comes from some other technique, but at the end, uh, boils down to the same thing. So we have a robust optimization program uh, problem, 
which is the same as before, but different bounds for the disturbance. At least the constraints are the same as before. The cost function now is quadratic uh, instead of being, uh, of being uh, linear. Voila, it's time to do a checkpoint. So before doing the break, this is what we have seen so far. We have seen that when we have uncertainty about part of the variables, we call them disturbances, then one standard way is to solve a problem where we replace the cost by the expected cost and where we replace the constraints by uh, intervals for the state variables that are true with a large probability here. And once we have that, we typically obtain a problem that has a robust uh, thing in the constraints, so it has the quantifier for all in the constraints, and we can have seen how to transform it, at least when it has this simple linear form, how to transform it into a standard optimization problem, and then bingo, we can use our standard linear program solver to get rid of the difficulty. Voilà, we'll do a break and resume at 10.15.